Hello? Okay. Well, hi. Well, welcome everyone to, uh, to this panel where we will be discussing the role of the founder versus the CEO. Uh, so I'm Anne Christine Roop. I'm the founder and CEO of Ethan Partners, um, an executive search company that focuses on high growth internet companies. Uh, so I, I founded the company seven years ago and I'm still the CEO today for now. <laughs> and um, yeah, I will, I'll let the panel introduce themselves. Yeah. Yep. Hi, everyone. Just raise your hand if you can hear me because that's definitely on. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. Uh, so my name is Rasa. Funny thing for this panel, legally I'm not a CEO and technically I'm not the original founder, but like we worked with hundreds of those. And currently I'm chief of strategy at Talent Garden Global and I'm heading also the Nordics as a managing director. My name is uh, Stefan Brun. I'm the managing partner at Nova Founders Capital. So we have a global portfolio of companies within fintech, education, professional services, and retail. Um, so in this context, uh, we found the businesses, but we are rarely the CEO of the business that we found on the long term. And I'm uh, Matthias Dalsgaard. I'm uh, the CEO and founder, or one of the founders of uh, GoMore, which is a car sharing platform. We help people share cars in, uh, in Denmark, Sweden, Norway, France, and Spain. We've been working on this for almost seven years now as uh, Anne Christine on, uh, on her business. And uh, yeah, I'm still both founder and CEO. We'll talk about if that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think actually, I think this is a topic that is uh, probably very, very, very close, close to home and quite emotional, at least for a lot of founders. Um, when, when building a company, you know, when suddenly when the company starts to grow and scale, that, that decision, and I think there always comes a time where, where a founder has to make that decision, should I, should I continue as, as founder, or sorry, as CEO, or should I hire someone in um, as the company scales? So that is, that is what we will be discussing here today. So it, maybe we can start off with, you know, the role of the founder versus the CEO. What, what, what are the main characteristics for, for both roles and how would you define um, a, good, uh, a good founder and a good CEO? So yeah. Okay, I, I'll, I'll, I'll try to start. So um, in, in, in a way, of course you can describe it in, in, in many different ways, but in a way you can say it's two different things. And maybe you say that the founder role is more on uh, dreams, stories and values side of the equation and the CEO role is more on the professional side of the equation like can you actually manage and build a company and I think so now we've been working on go more we have around 100 uh, people in, in the company and and my role has changed a lot like that the experience I guess for every CEO of a, of, a, of a company that's that's growing and your role changes a lot over time so sometimes I see myself becoming more of a CEO than a founder in the sense that I forget to talk about the things that matter to people, like the values, the things we dream about, or the things we like to do uh, together. So I sometimes need to remind myself to be the founder and talk about the things that people like and not just be the manager, you know, trying to fix things or organize things. And, and as long as you can balance that, I don't know if I'm doing it well, like other <laughs> others will have to, to tell me that, but, but I think as long as you can move between these two dimensions and follow the company, it's probably a good thing that you're both a founder and a CEO, but, but if, if the balance is lost at, at some time, of course, it's maybe uh, the right time then to start thinking of if, if someone else should be running the company or you should rather be the founder, talking about other things than actually uh, 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 management, right? But it's, it's like every day you go from three people in a company to five to 10 to 20 and suddenly I don't talk to everyone uh, uh, every day and, and I need to find ways of managing also my role as a founder. And it's super hard, like it doesn't work all the time, but I need to then try to think back and okay, what would it mean for me to now play the role of a founder, which is different than it was five years ago. So, like, if you're good at balancing, I, I, I think it's very good for a company that there's a founder and CEO and the same person. But, but when you lose the balance, of course, it might be the time to change. Mm. Completely agree, and I think just to add to that, I think when it comes to the founder role, that one is quite constant over the course of the lifespan of the business. You still have to focus on values, you have to focus on direction and overall vision throughout the journey. 
whereas the CEO role changes quite a bit from the different stages. So in the beginning, when you might be fighting to find a proof of concept, you might be fighting to get your unit economics to work, that's one kind of role. Once you then have a proof of that concept and it's just, ar just around scaling, uh, it becomes a very different role. So I think the big difference in my world is that the role of the founder does not change materially throughout the lifetime and, and the journey of the business, whereas the role of the CEO trend uh, changes tremendously throughout. Yeah, and I actually think that both positions and both roles are piece of art. But I think it really depends like where your company is and what do you want and what do you have to invest your time in. So for me, like eventually, if I see all those founders also like from the Talent Garden Network, it's eventually about three things. Making sure you get the first cash in, making sure you have an outstanding product vision, and you get the best possible people on board. While the CEO has to make sure that you have cash on the ongoing basis <laughs> and you have those people happy, working and organized and that your product that was created and is being created is being scaled and growing. So this is how we at least like distinguish these two roles, but they are really interconnected. Yeah, yeah, thank you. It would be, it would be great to, um, to hear your thoughts on, you know, some of it has already, there has already been some suggestions, but what are the advantages and disadvantages of the founder continuing to act as CEO as, as the company grows and scales? Maybe I start again then. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I really like what both uh, Stefan and, and Rasse was saying. And, and, and just one thought about uh, myself and my own role is that, so, so it's true in a way that the founder role is, is constant, as, as Stefan says, because it's the values, it's the vision, it's the dreams. Even though, of course, you also learn a lot about your own company as you grow. So in a way, you have to keep learning while there's still some, 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 some uh, constant factor uh, in it. I agree on that. But the funny thing is that the more we grow, the more we become professional, the more like weird and crazy I also have to remember to be, to play the role of the founder. Like now I say at, at every party, we, we sing songs and I'm also the plan is I next thing is I buy a piano for the office. So remember to do things that are like nice and human and social mm -hmm. together, because I, I feel it becomes harder and harder to remain human and uh, social as you grow as a company. So in a way, you have to fight harder and harder to be a, a let's say a founder with dreams and values. The more the company grows, so so so, so it's, it's it's just funny how you, in a way, I, I feel like I have to as, as I said before, become even more of the weird founder sometimes than I had to before to show that. I do other things than just business. You know what I mean? Mm. So, so, so anyhow, yeah, it's just a thought coming out of what, what, what Stefan said. The disadvantages, of course, is that you're, if you're only good in one area or not in the other, of course, they'll, they'll start being a, 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 a lack of uh, a balance, right? Um, but I think, I, I would guess the longer you can have the same in one person, the better, but you have to be really uh, ready to make the decision not to have the same role or all roles in one person when you see that it's just not the right fit or at least try to I, I try to outsource things that are more of the let's say the professional areas so, so we also have financing and leasing and and like part of our business we have many different business areas now and 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 all the business areas that are not like core to our brand identity i think they're easier to outsource and and they can be run by others better than by me whereas there's something you can't outsource so, so, so it's just I mean one way to go is that you say now now you split the role the founder and CEO or maybe you find a position for the CEO inside the company where he or she can act as a founder freely still because other people who are stronger in other areas take more care of those uh, areas but I think eventually for me, like one of the admirable things about founder-led companies, when the founder is CEO, that you never lose your long-term vision. Mm. Then it's, of course, like making sure that you set that direction, but you always have that vision. And what I see sometimes happening, like it depends also how active is the founder in the company after hiring the CEO. But I often see that like sometimes the company loses a little bit the excitement and the vision. And it's nothing like bad about it. It's just that the founder has it in the DNA, in the blood, you know. You create it, you gave a birth to it, and you know where you want to head with it. And this is what I admire about founders and CEOs in one who still like decide to go through that path because it's crazy. You have to learn lots of things. You not necessarily are the great manager, or the great CEO, and you have to make a massive like exponential learning curve, but I think the company has an advantage here. Mm. 
I think it comes down to, to looking up what the different tasks are, and I think that's what, in my view, should define whether you're a CEO or CMO or whatever you do in the company. Um, early on in my career, I was part of joining a company called Groupon, where we worked in, in Asia, and the interesting thing there is that Andrew Mason, the founder there, was a tremendous founder. Absolutely amazing at building the culture, all the things Matthias were talking about before, making sure that anyone who worked with him was just feeling like this is the kind of stuff I want to do. Um, he wasn't as great a CEO, but he managed to build a team around him of people who could get him there. So I think it's important to look at those things and not saying necessarily that because you founded the business, you have to be the CEO. If that was a rule set in stone, you would have no founder teams, right? Because you can't really have these co-CEOs. So at some point, you need to accept and say, look, what is the way wherein I can add the most value to this business? And if you are a true founder and you have that love for the business, not being the CEO and therefore not making all those calls into that, um, it might not be a problem. So I think it all comes down to what is it actually you're good at. And that may change throughout the life cycle of the business. Maybe you're great at scaling it whenever the business is actually running. Um, most founders are probably better at the early stages with the grinding and, and really sort of having to be very clear in your mind about what you're trying to do because it might be tough every day and you have to make ends meet financially and all those kind of things. So you need a very strong intrinsic motivation. Um, but I think it comes all down to capabilities. And sometimes that can be the founder is the CEO. Sometimes the founder is better at doing something else and sometimes yeah, sometimes they might not even work there after some time, but that's a different story. Yeah, and I think like what's really important here is about like there is no traditional setup of like what founders and CEOs do if they are two different individuals in the company. And I think a beautiful example of when founder steps down as a, as a CEO of the company and says, now I'm going to be the chief of product or chief of marketing, or now I'm going to be the chief of people and culture because that's the most important thing for this company and this is where I can give the greatest value. So I think that like we don't have to have a stereotypical thinking about how to divide those roles, but rather admit like, where can I spend my time and where is my time most expensive and most valuable? Yeah. And um, yeah, very true. yeah, and I can see time is is running quickly. But um, you know, it, it would be great to to um, talk about why and when should a startup consider hiring an external CEO in um, to the to the company. I, I can start on that one. <laughs> um, I think when the current team doesn't have the skills to take the business to the next stage. I think that's the very simple part. And depending on what kind of business it is, those skills will be different. Maybe it's around you're very capital intensive and you need to fundraise. Maybe it's around you need to be much better at marketing and the people you have don't have that. Maybe it's a product thing. Maybe it's whatever it might be. Uh, but it comes down to capabilities in my view. And of course, it's not now uh, as, as, as Nova, in Nova you play more of an investor role than you know, just running a company kind of role as, as, as I do. And, and, and you see it also more from the investor perspective. Of course, it's hard, I, I guess, always for the individual CEO to know when it's the right time. You know what I mean? Like, we are all like pretty bad at understanding our own or seeing our own weaknesses. We know a lot about what we would like and what we want, but seeing our own weaknesses is, is, is just really hard. Of course, I, I completely agree with what uh, Stefan says, but you might probably need some, some help sometimes to see when it's the right time. And of course, the right time, it's not you can't say it's after one, two, three, or four, or 100 years. You can just say it's when the skills are not the right ones overall for growing uh, uh, the business. But of course, it's, 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 it's a hard decision to make also for shareholders because it will come with a great cost when you, it, it's, it's a big disruption of a company. Wow. When you, I guess it's also why it's a theme for a discussion. Mm. Here today, also there's an, an investors uh, walking around being interested in this theme because of course everybody knows when you have to do it, it's painful and costly. Uh, but the company might need some outside help to see when it's uh, the right time. Yes, I think yeah. if I can add to that, I think it also comes down to at what times do you have to replace the CEO mm -hmm. versus just adding people to that team. Yeah. It might yeah. be you can do it by getting in a strong COO or getting in a CMO, whatever skills you're, you're needing. Yeah. So I completely agree, it's, it's, it's exactly. a tough one. Yeah. Obviously, if the CEO is not mm -hmm. able to mm -hmm. hire that mm -hmm. team, then that mm -hmm. I think is the bigger problem. Yeah. But, but I guess also what, th th that's all uh, like, I'm managing a lot of, or some managers, right? And, and what I also try is, is the same. When something is not working, we say, okay, can we man up around this person, a woman up around this <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, person, right? To make a strong team combined. Yeah. It's only sometimes after a while you realize that it's not never really happening like the way you want it to happen or they keep attracting the wrong kind of people. Or for some reason, you know, mm. some people are just better at recruiting than others. 
And after a while, you have to start concluding that it's not just a coincidence that you keep having not strong people mm -hmm. on these specific teams, right? But, but of course, it's a much better way, if you can manage it, to man up around a person than just to change everything because it, yeah. it, it comes with a big cost when you do it. Yeah. yeah, I also absolutely agree. I think that there is like no, it, you don't go by the book. It's not about the company size and the timing. You truly look into capabilities. Is your team good enough and capable to pull it off? And if you are as an individ individual still feeling comfortable in what you do and you have a faith and believe in yourself. So it's, it's a very like dependent on the company case. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and I, I must admit, um, so we, we, we work with a lot of, investors actually and and hiring CEOs is a search that we do quite regularly so so I'm definitely yeah, familiar with how how difficult it can be for both for founder to let go of the reins and uh, and pass on the the the, the title um, SEO to, to someone else but also you know finding someone for the company to, to actually fill the shoes of a founder, which is not, not, not necessarily that the founder is not going to be involved in the company, but, but to take on that CEO role, it is, um, yeah, it does have a very big impact on the um, company. But a thing that I've actually noticed is for a lot of the founders, when, if, if they've been involved for a long time with the company, and then when, when a CEO is hired, sometimes it, it can be a relief for founders, especially founders that have never been CEOs before starting a company, um, that they actually get someone to help support them with the more admin part of part of the business and with KPIs and goals and managing multiple markets if, if that's the stage the company's at. Um, I think just to that, I, I don't think many people start a business because they love KPIs, for example. No. Right, so no. I think it's important also to see that not everyone Say, you know what, I want to start this business <laughs> so that one day I can look at spreadsheets. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. so I think it, it comes down to that. But it, uh, to add to your other point, what we also see is often that if you keep the original team engaged versus not keeping them engaged at all, so a, a clear replacement if the investors jump in, which is obviously much, much more controversial, yeah. uh, that's a much bigger disruption because you completely lack the continuity and therefore you, you often get a break in the vision because now suddenly someone else has to get that vision under their skin. It's not just a matter of talking to the founder for 10 minutes and okay, now great, I spoke <laughs> to Matthias, now I understand everything around, but go more is because obviously sleeping and, and living that, that vision means it's much clearer and can probably answer more questions. And I think that's, that's the risk. So having that transition from one CEO, but the founders are leaving, I think that's, that can be very, very disruptive and dangerous. Yeah, yeah. And actually, um, you know, fi final question is also... No, a um, question to you. Oh, yes, sir. Do you follow, so you replace a lot of CEOs. Yes. How well does it go? Do you come back the year after and uh, say, okay, no. that was a good idea? <laughs> well, actually, so, so a comment that I have about that is um, I, I personally see that it works better when the founder continues to be involved with the company. So, but then takes on a different role. Um, and and the, the title, I come across some very... Uh, original titles for, for the founders, but that they're still somewhere on the company. And it can be anything from just motivating the team or dealing with investors or, or doing PR. Um, it, it, can, it can be lots of different roles. I, I think if, if suddenly, like if the founder or even if mo several co-founders suddenly leave the business and there's a complete replacement of management, it, it's not that it necessarily goes bad but it takes longer time for the company like to recover it will, it will definitely like i think a lot of things like productivity and maybe it will decrease but then increase over time hopefully if it's the right hire um so luckily we've actually had really good experiences uh personally Surprise. and and <laughs> actually but a thing that we probably ha see even more common is actually that a company hires a coo in or even we've even seen a, a cpo if it's a very product-focused uh, company, and then that role transitions, so they actually work alongside the founder for a while, and that's something that a lot of both CEO or founders and investors do intentionally, so that it doesn't disrupt the company, and that's actually why I see the best results. Hiring someone in to co-CEO the company, and it can even be for a few years, and then the CEO gradually pulls out. Um, that's why I personally see the best, the best results. Um, but yeah, fi fi final question, and we just have a few minutes here. How, how can we avoid, so, so uh, you know, statistically, 
it is common for the founders to stay involved in the companies, even if it's just a board member or, or as a shareholder. Um, so how, how can we avoid conflict of interest between found, a founder or fa co-founders and a CEO that's been hired into the company? How can we minimize um, or avoid conflict of interest? <laughs> I'm, I'm not, I, I think there will be conflict when you start uh, changing things, but the, the more you can do things gradually and let people learn, or let the founder in this case here, or let's say just the manager, or be, be, be that, that, that's what I uh, deal with uh, uh, in, 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 in my job, the more you can make a person see that there are other people who can help this person, like exactly making it more of a gradual transition and you start sort of dividing roles naturally before you then come to a conclusion that okay we have to really make a change here i think the easier uh, it will be because the person might also learn as you said also before there is a big relief starting to get some some help but but of course the more you just out of the blue announce that now it's time to make a change uh, the more conflict you'll also get out of it might be necessary but yeah, it'll be yeah. painful yeah, if I can say on this, like, um, actually this summer we changed nearly 50% of our global team and executive committee and because we are like just massively growing into the huge scale up phase and that's difficult. But like we also had some beautiful learnings about that transitions and like here what we also see that like the mistake that the new CEO, CEO or COO could do when you come to the company, don't set an agenda for yourself and for the company, set an agenda for the founder and with the founder. I think it's a lot of like in the first weeks and months, it's a lot of like personal befriending and really trying to understand how those two individuals think. And then you can think about the processes about like other team meetings, etc. And like, you have to trust each other. You have to build the unconditional trust among the CEO and the founder if you're going to work closely together. And I see that sometimes the CEO comes pumped with lots of energy and just starts setting up the agenda for the company. Like, and, the, and the founder starts feeling a little bit like a side or not necessarily where the company should be going. So I think that's, that's the general concern. I think the, the potential conflicts can come from both sides, right? It can come from the original founder if they're not willing to let go. So obviously it comes down to where does the decision to change the CEO come from? Uh, so that has to be easy. There needs to be some maturity and some acceptance and self-awareness on that part, which I think comes back to Matthias' earlier point around the potential blindness around what are you actually good and not so good at as a founder and knowing whether or not you're sufficient. On the new CEO side, I think the number one thing we have seen uh, for people coming in is many people seem to have this urge to say, okay, now I'm the CEO, I want to define something and change something. And it seems like a very common thing. I don't think anyone comes in and says, now I just need to change, but it seems like an urge to change something. And I think that's the first part because that can be quite disruptive and sometimes not well considerate. Um, and the second thing around that could be that many people, if they haven't been very experienced as a CEO before, um, may have a tendency to believe that they need to have the answer to all the problems. And especially as if you're joining a new organization, if you haven't had that sort of incubation period in the company, uh, you will not have the right answers. And there will be many things in the business that intellectually you might get, but emotionally you may not really understand. And therefore you might be tempted to make the wrong calls. And if you don't talk to other people, understand the business, the founder, the people who have been there for a long time, these kind of people, the investors, the, the board members, you might completely miss that and then you will alienate the entire organization, which I think is the worst case scenario. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. So uh, I can see we are already over time. So I would like to thank the panel for your thoughts and insights. It was a really interesting discussion. And uh, thank you to the audience for listening in.